If you have your Bibles open to the book of 1 John, if you would please. 1 John chapter number 2. We'll continue our series in the book of 1 John. Just enjoy. I enjoy studying 1 John. Enjoy his writing style in the Bible. Though all of it's written by the Holy Spirit, but uses different authors uh, through that. And John just brings, continually brings some great statements to us. And tonight, I believe this passage of Scripture is no different. If you remember last time, uh, we talked about love to the brother, love as a church family, and part of the market, and really Jesus said the banner that we wave as Christians is love for fellow Christians. And tonight in the next passage of Scripture as we look at this, uh, John takes a slight shift, a slight, a, a slight focus change. You'll find in the Bible, as you read every day in the Bible, that different writers or different books will have a different style. All right, some will, will hammer a point home for a while. Some te- seem to jump uh, f- from theme to theme. And John sometimes jumps a little bit, but always comes back to these major themes throughout, throughout his books. Uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and of course the, the Gospel of John. And tonight as we kind of shift, we're looking in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 through 14. It, 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 I'm glad that... Um, there is a person who's not here tonight because I can talk about them then. All right, and now, of course, you all be tuned in. Say, like, who is not here? You look around, you're like, ooh, everyone sits in the same spot, so we need to look around who normally sits next to me and is not there tonight. And um, though I am thankful that uh, Albert, Brother Albert here, got saved a couple weeks ago, got baptized this morning back in church tonight. Amen? That's a blessing. See him and brought his two daughters here. But Brother Lee Edwards is not here tonight. You say, oh no, where's Brother Lee? He had to run down to Florida, he told me, and checking on some things. But it, it made me think w- with this particular section of Scripture about an experience I had with Brother Lee a few years back. It was a school camp. Brother Lee was in a room with myself and a couple other men. We sat there. I asked Brother Lee Edwards, who many of you know uh, has been faithful and served God for years and years and years as in the secular workforce, all right, but was always ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ to those around him faithful in church, discipling people. And uh, a little while ago, about a year and a half ago or so, uh, his wife went to be on with the Lord. And Brother Lee has just been a mentor and a dear friend of mine, chairman of the deacon board here, just a man who loves God, a man who who really I could find no fault in in any way that I view him, just a man who loves God. And and I love the time when I sat down um, at school camp just listening to him talk. I asked him during that time if he would share, you know, some of those life experiences and Brother Rodney, were you with me at that time or one of these times? not sure you were there. I, th- I think so. All right. If so many, yeah. Just shake your head yes, all right? You're, you're a missionary. Just say yes. <laughs> it's terrible. He began to share about life. He began to share some thoughts and kind of dial back kind of a history of his life. And I, I wish I could have taken every one of you in here and put you in that, cramped in that little room with the bunk beds and listened to Brother Lee Edwards talk. A man who began to talk about God's goodness in his life, about God's grace in his life, about how God used him to influence other people. And I would, I would call it, if I could, like some father time. I could just sit there and soak up what he's saying. Because I'll be honest with you, I don't have all the answers, and to be honest, neither do you. And neither does he, but we can always learn from somebody else. But Brother Lee Edwards, what a wealth of information. And if he were here tonight, all right, he'd be so embarrassed. If he's watching on live stream, then Brother Lee, I completely apologize to you. And by the time you get back, hopefully you'll forgive me. I look at this section of Scripture where John begins to talk, and he, I view it as a little bit of a father time where John now brings us some encouragement to continue. There are times that we, that we may uh, get sidetracked a little bit in life. We get off focus, or as now the, the popular word is, mission drift. We get off the, the beaten path, but we get off where we ought to be. And John, in this particular section of Scripture, in 1 John, tries to bring us back and remind us why, why he's doing and why we're doing what we're doing. If you look behind me on the wall, there's our theme for this year, the verse. If you read it with me, it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We've got to adopt it this year on either side of the, the stage. You'll see that the words continue. And tonight as we look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, I want us to look at and be encouraged to continue. John says this, I write unto you little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write, have written unto you young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome 
the wicked one. Lord, I thank you for this time we have tonight. Lord, I ask that you would help me to have the wisdom that I so desperately crave and need. Lord, as I try to handle your word as honestly and openly and sincerely as I can, Lord, I need your strength and grace to present it in a way that would be received. Lord, I pray for the, the, the people who are listening to your word tonight that they would have a soil that is soft and ears that would hear your truth. Lord, I pray that we'd respond as you touch us, your spirit touches us in our heart, respond the right way, Lord. We can always block our ears and close off our minds, but Lord, I pray that tonight your word would accomplish everything that you wish it to accomplish. Lord, I ask that nothing would hinder the service tonight, Lord, but that you would accomplish and that your word would be, it would be there with power. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. John, throughout this book, will use little phrases like, my little children. He adopts kind of a, a fatherly picture uh, and a fatherly attitude because he was, he was John the Elder, he, or he was an older, older man, and these all were young Christians compared to John and his life and his legacy and, and what he had seen and walked with Jesus Christ while Christ was on earth. So they come to this section, it is sandwiched between a couple other themes. Uh, next week or the week after or so, we'll hit the, the phrase, love not the world. You'll find that, I believe it's verse number 15 or so, love not the world, a very popular passage. We've heard messages on it before, we'll come back to that again. And, and after that, he'll, he'll jump to some other thing about abiding in Christ and, and loving. But right in the middle, all right, he, he talks about three reasons why he's written to these three groups of people. It's almost like John takes a second and takes a pause and begins to have, if I can, a dad moment. I unfortunately now have dad moments. The things that were laughed at while I was growing up of my father, now my kids laugh at me about. I don't think it's fair, Brother Whitterberry. All right, because, you know, but, but I have dad moments. I, I catch myself saying things like, oh, man, that's, uh, that sounds like a father. You know, things like, don't run with knives. I think I told you this, but at Man Up Camp, Johnny came, and, and, and Johnny was cutting something, and, and he cut his, he cut with a knife, cut his, his uh, right next to his thumb pretty badly. He came to me down there, it was bleeding. Uh, we, we got it all fixed. It was fine. I mean, they, you know, honey, nothing happened at Man Up Camp. It was fine. Nothing happened. As he came up, he, he, he came up, showed me this thing, blade he's holding it, and he hands me the knife like I'm going to take away his knife because he didn't use it properly. And I said, Johnny, listen, man. I said, we all going to cut ourselves at some point in life, right, men? We who know how to cut, all right, don't make the right choice. I said, Johnny, here's something to remember. Always cut toward your buddy, not your body. <laughs> and um, <laughs> listen, I'd rather pray for you than pass out of my own blood. And... Uh, kind of a father time and, you know, just truisms, truisms in life. You come to the section and I see John is saying, listen, I'm writing unto you for, for a couple of reasons, little children, young men and fathers. So we look at this tonight, I'm, I want to have us challenge, be challenged to continue. Uh, the first thing I see in this is three segments, three separations or three groups of people that John specifically lists. I'm going to tell you now where I'm going with this first point. Everyone's included. All right, that's where I'm going. He first of all talks to little children. Young in stature, young in age, young in maturity. This particular word in the Greek would not have been referring to infants, but a young child. I, I believe, as I look at the passage and study it, that it was not just speaking to young children as an age, but young in the faith. I say that because often in this book, he refers to little children, and he's not just writing to seven-year-olds. These other concepts are for all of us. So when he brings this word back, there's definitely an application that, that he's writing to young people in the faith and young people of age too. Do you know I got some kids tomorrow going to elementary school? All right, how many kids here are going to BBA tomorrow morning elementary school? All right, raise your hand. Come on, let me see you. All right, you know that God loves you so much. Pastor Olette told me this last night that he heard this. There was a, a little young person, and they said their, their favorite day, was it Mrs. Olette? The favorite day was the last day of school. And the second favorite day was the first day of school. Did I get that right? And the last day of school, obviously, because then the summertime starts. But the, the first day of school was the second favorite day because um, the teachers were never any nicer than they were the first day of school. <laughs> that, about that, about right? Yeah. So how true is that? <laughs> but you're going to elementary school tomorrow. Do you know that God loves you? And John here is writing to you right there. He has something for you to learn in the Bible. 
It's not just for your parents or for your brothers or sisters or for your grandparents. It's for you, not just for me, for you. I don't care if you're in K-5, if you're in second grade or third grade or sixth grade. God has something for you. And conversely, I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care if it's five minutes or it's ten years or it's three years. God has something for you. He writes to little children, first of all. Then he writes to fathers. Not just referring to men who have children. But writing to the, to the men who in this particular application, men who would have been established, we'll look at this throughout the sermon, defined by ancient, maybe gray hair, or no hair. Fathers, they're established. They've accomplished some things. They've seen some things. They've been through some things. This is not their first rodeo. One of my favorite phrases. Then he writes to young men. People who are growing actively spiritually. Not a babe in Christ, but not ancient in age or spirituality. In the Bible time, this would have been somewhere between 20 and 40 years old. And while he may have referred to somewhat to that age category, I believe I can safely say and confidently say that John is making a point here to say, listen, I'm writing to every single person that reads this epistle. Whether you've been saved or you are young, one day, one hour, one week. Whether you've been saved 10 years, you're 20 years old, 30 years old, whether you've been saved most of your life and now you're at the end of your life, I have something for you in this passage. Can you see how John, it seems like for a moment, adopts a little bit of father time, family time? He says, I've written to you, you little children, your fathers, and your young men. If we're saved, we fit into one of these categories. I think about a few years back in 2002, there was an act passed. It was said, no child left behind. In 2015, that was uh, succeeded by this, every student succeeds act. Inside of those parameters, inside of those acts, I was uh, attunedly acquainted with them because my wife was in education. Of course, I was a principal here at the school. And so learning about those particular acts and uh, those nuances of those acts, the, the big point was to not leave anybody out. So everyone had a chance, everyone had an opportunity, and I, and I feel that in a sense, in this interpretation that John is saying, listen, little children, young men and fathers, I don't want to leave you out. You can't just read this and say, what about me? Nor can you say, well, I don't have to worry about me either. Everyone who's a Christian is included in this. But then I see really three sketches. Not only does he define them that way. He defines them by some statements that he makes. In verse 12, he says this, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. The the word that I wrote down that would define little children and why I believe the application is beyond just a young and aged person is this, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has brought you a change in your life. Your status has been changed for, as the Bible says, His, Jesus' name's sake. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Years ago, a man had preached a message on that particular verse, and in that message, he had made it sound like God wanted to destroy the world, but Jesus argued with God and then changed God's mind. And that God was angry, but Jesus turned to God and basically said, and, and, and what he said was Jesus said, well, for my sake, will you, will you not destroy them? And the problem that I have is that message is really not what the Bible says, because my Bible says in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, and, and that word for his namesake and for Christ's sake in Ephesians 4, 32, does not in, in, imply that Christ was arguing with God But it was for Christ's benefit, our benefit at Christ's expense. His sake, his atonement, which fits in perfectly with what we know in verse number 2 of 1 John chapter 2, where the Bible says, and he is the propitiation, the atonement, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, it was not out of argument, but out of benefit. 
We are saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And John says, little children, you have been forgiven. Don't forget that. You have been forgiven. You say, now why would John mention that? I think for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know that sometimes the devil wants to come back in and say, listen, why would God save you? After you've been saved, maybe 50, 60 years, perhaps those arguments don't have the same effect that they would have had if you've been saved just a few days, a few hours, or a few weeks, or months, or year. Why would God save you? You can't see any victory. You can't do anything. What, you, know, you, you don't deserve this, and we don't deserve it. But he says, listen, don't forget, little children, you've been forgiven. Amen. You've been forgiven for his name's sake. I would say this to those who've been saved a little while. Don't look down on the young Christians. After a while, Christians, we can become so pious in our Christianity. Well, <laughs> look at those new Christians. Look at them. They just got saved and baptized. That's tremendous. They're so excited to be at church. Isn't that neat? Almost like we look at new couples, right? Oh, look at them. They just got married. That's so cute. You know, brother, brother Jackie, or brother Jackie, brother Eric and Jackie. Thanks. <laughs> Freudian slip. Brother Eric and Jackie, they're sitting so close. Give them a couple weeks and they'll be in different rows. <laughs> right. But we do that for new Christians, don't we? Oh, look at them. They're excited to be here. They, they even got here. They even got here for Sunday school and they got here early. Oh, that's so, that's so cute. Don't they know good Baptists arrive late? Oh, look at them. They, they even want to sit closer. Don't they know good Baptists sit in back? It's where the good preaching is in back. Where I can kick back and close my eyes no one can tell that I'm sleeping. Oh, yeah, I can tell. I still have good eyes. He said, what's the difference between you and pastor? I can still see the back without glasses. <laughs> that, that's the only difference, so don't be so pious. Well, look at those new Christians. They actually listen to what the pastor says. I remember one time I had someone come to me when Pastor Let was preaching. They said, boy, I just don't get anything out of Pastor Let's sermons. It's always preaching about soul winning. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe you ought to go soul winning. Hello. We get so pious after we get saved a little bit, have a little bit of time saved. Oh, look at them. They're li listen, perhaps, listen, the pastor would keep us out of some trouble, would it not? Uh, maybe it keep, help keep our homes together. Perhaps it wouldn't hurt to have the faith of a child in Jesus Christ. You see, it's marked by forgiveness. And he talks to the fathers, and he says, Fathers, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. The night I was talking to Brother Edwards, there was no doubt in my mind. I listened to that man speak that he didn't just know about Jesus, he knew Jesus. He hadn't just read about Jesus, he'd walked with Jesus. He'd not just heard that Jesus would answer prayers. He had seen God answer prayers. And he says, I've, I'm writing to your fathers, you have known him. A working knowledge of him that is from the beginning. The word I'm using right there, there's wisdom there. There's wisdom. Wisdom in the word. Wisdom about the world. The stand they take and the stand they took. There's wisdom talked to Pastor Led, asked him the other day, I said, Pastor, let me pick your brain on something. Pastor Led's a man full of wisdom, a man who knows Jesus, not just about Jesus. I can talk about him. He's not here. Just Miss Chrissy. She's here. And, uh, and Pastor's preaching her. Just got done preaching tonight down in Howell, Michigan. He's a man that I, that I talk to. I need his wisdom. You better say amen. <laughs> and he's a whole lot wiser than I am. Hey, I'm waiting for that one right there. Yeah. Well, just as long as my wife doesn't yell as loud as she is. <laughs> and that's the picture of a father in this passage. And I hope, I hope children, elementary kids, little children, young men women, and women, all right, implied there, that you have some fathers and mothers that you seek wisdom from. See, Proverbs says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I hope there's some people that help keep you on the straight and narrow. You can say, listen, listen, let me pick your brain. People who, this isn't their first rodeo. People who will look at you and say, you know what? I wouldn't do that if I were you. Hey, have you thought about this? And, and I, love, I love asking pastor because he'll say things like this. Well, this is my pastor. I'm like, okay, whatever. You're my pastor, so tell me what to do. 
I need that wisdom. I want that wisdom. I crave that wisdom. And, and John says to the fathers, listen, I write unto you because you have known him that is from the beginning. And he says, I write to you young men. He said, I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. He said, I, I see some, some men, obviously women implied there as well, who've seen some strength have some strength and seen some victory. I would say that these are the, the, the ones that, that uh, at times the little children may not know better yet. They're, 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 they're forgiven, and, and fathers may get tired sometimes to fight the same battles, but young men and women are rolling up their sleeves, jumping into the trenches, and, and they're getting it on like Donkey Kong. All right, he says, I'm writing to young men because you have, you have seen some victory. You've overcome the wicked one because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He says there's some young men out there, all right, who are working, who are letting Christ work through them, and they're seeing the devil retreating because Christ is giving them the victory. Maybe they're the ones that are jumping on the bus. Maybe they're the ones that are saying, you know what, I'll go an extra hour, hour out calling. They're the ones who say, look, I'm quick to volunteer Listen, the ones who are fathers now, they're a little more tired now. I look at Pastor Ryan, and I can tell Pastor Ryan, I did your job, but you never did my job. I was youth pastor when I first came here to First Baptist Church for four years. Poor teenagers, I apologize. Poor parents. I look at some of that schedule now and the things that he does, and, and you know what? I love the teenagers. I love, I love the teenagers. I have a great time. And, and in fact, uh, the other night when I was out with Brother Wilkerson for supper on Tuesday night, and Pastor Lett was there, I, I told the little kids there, I said, listen, if this table gets too boring, I'm coming over here to this one. But even then, there's times I wouldn't trade with Pastor Ryan. I'll let him do that at camp. You know what, Pastor Ryan? The kids are running around at 1 o'clock in the morning. That's a good job for the youth pastor, isn't it? That's tremendous. You see, so I'm writing to you young men as well. There's some strength and victory there. And so I see three segments. I, three, I see three sketches. But then now I want to look at very specifically the three statements I believe he is challenging us with. Because he goes on in verse 14. He doesn't stop there. He, he defines this. He describes it. But he doesn't stop there. He declares something to us in verse number 14. And he begins at the end of verse number 13. He says this, I have written unto you, uh, little children, at the end of verse 13, because ye have known the Father. And so the challenge I'd give tonight to little children who are maybe young in the faith or young of age, continue in learning. Continue in learning. You have known. You are learning about the Father. So don't stop in that. Don't stop. I will teach you more. We should never, ever, ever stop learning about Jesus Christ. I don't care how old you are or how long you've been saved or how short you've been saved. You can continue to learn about Jesus Christ and have a sweet fellowship. Remember, that's the whole point of 1 John chapter number 1, walking with Jesus Christ in fellowship. Wouldn't be bad for some of us who've been saved more than a year to act like we've been saved two days. To open up this Bible with the same kind of excitement that we had maybe last year or last decade and say, God, I want to know you today. God, I want to learn about you. And to hear something and be like, wow. Remember those days, Christian? Remember the days when, when God seemed real as if you could touch him? Now we come to church and sit here. Little children continue in learning. I told the Sunday school class this morning, I believe it was, that we had uh, a while back a person at school, and kids always ask this question, but not in this way. They ask the question, when will I ever use this? Right, math class, a very popular question in math class. Remember the day Miss Evans came and said, the student just asked me, when am I ever going to learn this? The irony is that Miss Evans, Samantha Evans, teaches English class. And someone's asking, when will I ever use this English again? Maybe every day the rest of your life, if you live in America or other countries as well. Yeah, it's the same question that sometimes I feel we ask when we come to church. When am I ever going to use this? Maybe the rest of your life. Maybe when you get home tonight. You see, you ought to never stop learning. Kids, you're going to school tomorrow. You're going to learn a lot of things at school. You're going to learn about history and about science, but you're going to learn about Jesus Christ at Bridgeport Baptist Academy tomorrow. Don't miss that. I remember when I was in college that someone got up one time and said, don't let your classes get in the way of your education. 
What they meant was the academics are great and we need them, but there's something more important, and his name is Jesus Christ. Little children, you've known him. You've known the Father. And to go down to the last group at the end of verse 14, he says, I've written unto you young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. The guys in the sound booth, just you know, I'm jumping one other point. Just you know, they're looking at me like I'm weird. It's all right. I want to challenge the young people in here, by young people who would be my age, a little bit younger, maybe not in elementary school, maybe not saved three days or three weeks or three years now. Continue in victory. Continue in victory. The devil would like nothing better than to stop short what God wants to do at this church, at First Baptist Church, in your life. We've seen some tremendous things here over the years at First Baptist Church. I've been here 17 years now, and I can truly say God is at work here at First Baptist Church. This summer we've seen God work. This morning, many visitors, and that's tremendous. God is doing something. But, but let's continue. Who is it that defeated the wicked one? It was Christ in us. All right, the hope of glory, him working through us, it's not what we do except applying the power that he gives us. We have to use that power, but continue in victory. The word of God abideth, it abides in you. That means young men, young people, I'm talking about men and women now, the word of God ought to be abiding in you, all right, leaking out of your pores. The word of God ought to be coming out in conversation. It ought to be part of your life, part of your daily habit. The word of God will bring that victory and overcome the wicked one. The first conquest was darkness to light and salvation. But now greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we can always have victory in Jesus Christ. I believe that God wants to see here at First Baptist Church some homes that will stand for Jesus Christ. Some people who at work will stand for Jesus Christ. Who may say, please don't talk that way. That's my Savior. You know what? Come to my church. I think you'll enjoy learning about Jesus Christ here. I'm telling you right now that there, there are people out there who need what you have. Beyond that, there are people out there who want what you have, peace and joy and true love and satisfaction in your life. It's an amazing phenomenon we're going right now in Saginaw. I invite people to church, and more often than not, I hear this response, I've been looking for a church. I've been looking for a place. They're looking for the truth, and we have it. So let's continue in victory. Don't let the devil get a foothold. He wants to destroy your family, destroy your life, destroy your mind, destroy your finances. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But lastly, I see a challenge to the fathers. To those of you Christians in this church who have been saved longer maybe than I've been alive. First off, thank you. Thank you because you're still here at First Baptist Church. You're still serving the Lord. That to us who are coming behind you is a great monument, a great challenge, and a great testimony. John says this in verse number 13. He says, I write unto you, fathers, if you look with me, please, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. And then look at verse 14. You're going to think you just read the same verse again. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. You say, well, what happened there, John? Did, did you lose your place? Are you, are you know, you're getting a little older as you wrote First John here. Did you, you forget what you're saying? Or, you know, like, I, I've been around some people who like to repeat the same story as they get older, and maybe you have as well. Is, is that what John did, forget himself and repeat the same line? I, oh, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. You see, what I didn't quite define yet is that when John gave this idea to the fathers. There was another thought there as well. If you remember back in 1 John chapter number 1, John says, I'm a credible witness because I've seen him. I've touched him. I've heard him. When John writes to these fathers who were also old in age, similar in age to John, he was writing to people who very possibly had actually seen Jesus Christ himself. Who actually maybe saw or been part of the miracles that Jesus performed while on earth. Or if I put it this way, they had experienced the power of God. He says, fathers, you continue in your wisdom, 
Those who have been saved, who have known and experienced Jesus Christ, maybe physically, if not physically, spiritually. Old enough to have known Christ, inherently they have conquered. But, but to know Christ is to have all knowledge. Second Peter 1 verse 3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You see, some of you have been saved for a long time. And John's challenge and mine is continue. Continue in that. We need that. I think of a man, he's 86 years old. His wife went to be with the Lord in July 8, 2017. He has three honorary doctorate degrees. At the age of 21, he was called to preach. He pastored churches while attending college, and four years after graduation, he pastored a church in Kentucky and then served as an associate pastor at Calvary Baptist Church in Illinois before going off to be a missionary to Japan. He went to Japan in 1965 and planted a church in Osaka and then one in Kobe. Helped establish an independent Baptist Bible school and served as the first president of the school and then served as the Far East director of BIMI and served as president of that same organization for 19 years. He currently is the director emeritus of BIMI, mission organization. He's on staff at West Coast Baptist College, and he preaches in mission conferences, Bible college, and seminaries. His name is Don Sisk. He's a man I'm hoping to get here to preach here if I can next summer. In July, at leadership conference, I had the privilege of hearing Don Sisk, a man who has served and dedicated his life to Jesus Christ and the gospel, preached. He recently, I believe, fallen and broken. I believe it was his hip, so he could not stand while he preached, so he sat. This man preached a powerful message from God's Word. He has since that time, being retired, written two books, one called Fourth Quarter and one called Overtime after that. He's a man who was gray-headed and faithful. I listened to him speak that day, and my heart was touched. In fact, if, if you ever hear that message, your heart's not touched, check your salvation at the door, because something's wrong with you. It was powerful. And I'd encourage you, elder saints in our church to stay faithful if you've known him from the beginning finish strong because we're watching you we need that i need it there are other couples in this church other singles other teenagers other children in this church who need you to continue mom dads keep overcoming little children you've been forgiven keep learning but continue following jesus christ in each point, the answer points back to Jesus Christ. Let's continue. Lord, I thank you for your word, for the challenge from John tonight. Lord, I don't know where everyone is at in here. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to continue. Lord, there are some young people who need to get serious about knowing you. Lord, there are some moms and dads who need to get alone with you to get some victory in Jesus Christ. Or maybe there's someone here tonight who is thinking about giving up, not staying faithful and finishing strong. Lord, may they be challenged by your word. I wonder who would say, Pastor Howe, would you pray for me tonight? I need to continue. I want to learn about Jesus Christ. I, I want to be that example to others around me. I, I need some victory in my life right now. Would you pray for me? I want to continue. God, touch my heart tonight. Would you pray for me? Amen. 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 I want to continue. I want to be that example. I need some knowledge. Amen. Lord, you've seen the hands. You know the hearts. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to respond to your word like we asked at the beginning of the service, the way we ought to. Lord, may we not stop our ears. May we not just think, well, I hope so-and-so heard that. But when we apply it from your word, in Jesus' name, amen.